Hello class, welcome to the first half of the gastrointestinal tract, the digestive system. So uh, split it in two, so I'll go over um, some of the review of the things that are going to be important, and then uh, we'll get uh, right to the signs and symptoms and the various diseases. All right, well, of course, um, this all begins, as, as we talked about in the last lecture, looking at uh, what's going on in the oral cavity with uh, the food that's going to come in, food and drink, and you're going to start the digestion. Chemically and saliva with amylase, break down starches, and then the point is to get it to your pharynx where you can begin swallowing. That's a reflex, and then reflexively will go down your esophagus and hit your stomach. So up here in the oropharynx region and in the oral cavity, you got salivary glands coming in, right? Uh, talks about your teeth. And yeah, we follow our way down. It's gonna be this tube. It's gonna have similar uh, um, layers, the same layers all the way through, but modifications. So in your esophagus, no digestion is happening. It's just getting it through the thorax into the abdomen. So it can hit your stomach. Your stomach's a big expanded sac where you can uh, eat a lot of food at a buffet and store it and then you know, digest it at your leisure. Um, and of course it gets, well, we'll talk about you know, the functions of these things. And uh, yeah, so esophagus, stomach, small intestine, then large intestine or colon, uh, anus, outside. So between the mouth and anus is a tube that's open. So when you have something, when you swallow it, it's not really in your body because it's open on either ends. Uh, not until you absorb it into the bloodstream is it really you know, a part of you. Otherwise, swallow a penny, it's just taking a trip and it? it's going to come out the other end. And then for the, we have a separate lecture, a small lecture looking at uh, the pancreatico-biliary tract. So bile and pancreatic juice. So we'll talk about everything. We won't talk about uh, liver, gallbladder, uh, pancreas today. All right, so if you look along here, you see the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the path in this alimentary canal. Oh, you guys can see this. What do I need to, what should I remind you of? From the mouth, the pharynx, the back of your throat, the esophagus, just getting it down there, stomach. Small intestine is the site of uh, absorption. So the stomach is going to uh, do chemical, the mechanical digestion is going to hit it with muscles and hit it with acid and pepsin, and start breaking things down. Um, and then when you get in the small intestine, which is the longest part of this tract, that's all about <clears throat> there's enzymes hitting it immediately. And then uh, you're going to do di chemical digestion and absorption into the bloodstream. And all those absorbed nutrients go into the liver through the hepatic portal system to go back to your, your body systems. And by the time the, the food is done in your small intestine and hits your large intestine, also called your colon, um, you've absorbed all the nutrients, almost all the nutrients you're going to absorb. So the large intestine or colon is all about reabsorbing the water. And we'll see there's trillions of bacteria. So anything that's that was indigestible, chitin, cellulose, things we can't digest, bacteria get a chance to work on it. Um, yeah, I'll get there. And eventually rectum is the straight part where feces are stored. And then anus is the, the opening. And then accessory organs, right? The salivary glands, talk about those. And then liver, gallbladder, pancreas. So we'll get to those for sure. But the bile and pancreatic juice are going to hit right after the stomach in that duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, with a whole host of enzymes and bicarbonate ions to neutralize the acid. So digestion, mechanical, chewing it up stomach pulverizing it right and then chemically you know you can just uh, put a p uh, put some uh, uh, complex carbs in a peach in a um, test tube with some amylase and then chemically it will it will uh, break those bonds and turn polysaccharides to monosaccharides yeah and enzymes are the way uh, to speed things up the chemistry right so this digestion the purpose is to take our varied diet and break it completely down to the things we can absorb 
which are monosaccharides. Proteins have to be in amino acid form. Uh, nucleic acids have to be in nucleotides. And fats have to be just in the little fatty acid and glycerol to be absorbed into the bloodstream. So that's the deal. No matter what you eat, it's all going to turn into these basic things that can uh, are small enough to be absorbed through the mostly small intestine. <clears throat> so again, esophagus, we'll talk about some diseases there. You got you know, acid reflux things going on. Uh, so there's a sphincter here. It's not the strongest sphincter, but it keeps the stomach acid in the stomach as best it can. Um, and then the stomach, remember the anatomy there. Uh, the upper part is the fundus, air can gather there. And you have the body is most of it and the pyloric region there, the antrum, that leads to this sphincter here, the pyloric sphincter. And uh, if you were to look at it, it looks like it just has a little hole in the middle. Yep. And through that hole, uh, just a little bit of gastric contents will be squirted out. So the duodenum's not overwhelmed, it's just emptying the whole stomach, but little bits are let out at a time. When you look at the epithelium of the stomach, these deep, deep gastric glands. And these cells, remember the chief cells and parietal cells are making hydrochloric acid and pepsin and some other things. And mucus is made like crazy on the surface. And that whole top of the epithelium is eroded. Every week it's all digested away because it's such a harsh environment. It's a little pH you know, down to two and um, uh, pepsin that can you know, destroy proteins. Small intestine is the longest part of it. And uh, the duodenum, the first foot or so like this, it's pretty stuck to the back wall. And that's where it's hit with bile, pancreas juice, pancreatic juice, um, and uh, mucus glands there to kind of protect it because that chyme coming out of the stomach is really acidic. Uh, so the duodenum is the first little foot or so. And then uh, the jejunum and the ileum are the next parts of it. A bit difficult to tell gross anatomy wise, but it's just the whole your whole and small intestine actually gets smaller as you continue to the ileum. And you're gonna see there's uh, more and more bacteria towards the ileum in the colon, just kind of a couple um, trends there. And it's all, this is all about absorption. So you'll see the surface area is amazing. So looking at the small intestine here, it has these folds in there, you can see with your bare eyes. And then uh, if you look at a small intestine, it looks like velvet in there because it has all these little fingers that come out, the little villi and then microscopically microvilli. Yeah. So if you look at histological section of small intestine, you know, it has all these little fingers. It's like trying to dry yourself off with a bed sheet versus a plush towel, right? There's more surface area, the plush towel, those little fingers to trap all that water. Same thing here, it's for more surface area, more uh, absorption, diffusion. A lot of it's active transport too, but surface area is what it's about. The colon, or large intestine, by then, you know, you've got all the nutrients out of that milkshake -y, uh, fluid by that point. But here you want to reabsorb all that water that you poured in from the beginning with saliva and these juices, all this water. You can't just get rid of it. What you do with diarrhea, your body's like, let's get rid of everything, including bad bacteria. But normally you want to absorb that water back, take the waste, compact it, and get it ready for uh, excretion. And uh, we'll talk about all the bacteria that live in the colon. Pretty amazing too. So the anatomy of it, your cecum is where it begins. This is the sac. This is ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, because it's S-shaped. Rectum is this last little straight part. And then anal canal is just like the last inch or so right there. Skin kind of comes up in there. So that's the anatomy of it. You can see it looks as these kind of out pocketings, these pouches. And uh, makes it different than the small intestine. And all that longitudinal muscle is just put into these few stripes. And so movement in the large intestine is a little different than the small intestine. And histologically, lots of those clear goblet cells, lots of mucus to keep things moving along. <clears throat> the appendix, technically vermiform appendix, means worm-like, is a little guy that comes off your, your, your cecum you can live without it, of course. People get it removed all the time. It's, uh, it's vestigial. I mean, it's a, a, a throwback. If you look at uh, rabbits, koala bears, horses even, they have a huge appendix or cecum is huge, and they digest um, plant material in there. I don't have time for that whole lecture, but we have a little remnant of it. And our problem is it has a little opening here 
and that gets clogged, a fecal lith, like feces gets caught in there. Then it's a dead end too. And remember in the bronchi, if you block it, the, the mucus can't escape and you can get an infection. Same thing here, if that opening to the appendix gets blocked, uh, it can get infected in this appendix and it can grow and it can burst and threaten your life. So causes us problems, you can live without it. Um, yeah. And then the anus <clears throat> is the other end. We talked about the mouth before. And uh, you got stratified squamous epithelium at the very opening, just like I say, like, a, like an inch or so. And then you get into this uh, colon when you look in there uh, uh, with all the mucus cells in there. Um, and then in terms of muscles, we have an external sphincter that you control once you're past being a baby. And then an internal sphincter, which is part of the smooth muscle of the, the gut wall. Um, and when that gets stretched, it sends signals that say it's time to defecate, and then you can control that external one. Yeah, and this will come into play with all the blood vessels here. You get hemorrhoids if those uh, veins get uh, engorged. <clears throat> now, just to make sure we're on the same page, remember the gut tube has four layers. And uh, the innermost layer is the mucosa. And that includes the epithelium, which would be columnar, big cells, active cells doing a lot of absorption. And then you've got a, a little like space and some connective tissue in there. And then you even have a muscle layer, this, this muscularis mucosa. It's a, just a minor little muscle that it can contract, kind of moves the, the inner lining, all right? Not like the big muscle on the outside, but a little bit of muscle there is part of the mucosa. Submucosa is the space. And you can see glands will go into that, blood vessels and lymphatics, uh, connective tissues, the space between the mucosa and the muscular layer. And you have uh, circular and longitudinal layers to squeeze it this way or squeeze the, the whole gut that way. Yeah, it's smooth muscle, if you don't control it. And then the serosa is connective tissue on the outside. And if you look, if you were to cut open the abdomen and take a look at your stomach or look at all the intestines, they're gonna have this shiny layer on it. Um, it's the parietal uh, uh, peritoneum, we call it. <clears throat> and that uh, um, is continuous with these mesenteries where the whole gut tube is connected to your vertebrae in the back. And in most animals, it hangs down like a cat or a horse, but we walk upright, so our guts kind of sag downward in a little different way, but they're all connected to the back. But it's mesentery that holds all the blood vessels and nerves that are gonna go to the, uh, the gut tube itself. All right, so this is the basics. And everything from your esophagus to your stomach to your intestines all have these four layers. They just are modified depending on the area. Looking at uh, the ileum, awesome. So this is a small intestine. You can see these little, these are all fingers. These are all the fingers of the villi. So you know right away looking at that, oh, small intestine. And here are some uh, lymphatic tissue. You can see all the, the lymphocytes there. And then it's actually incorrect. This is, uh, this is all the muscular layers. It's just the, the circular longitudinal. And then you have, you'd have a serosa or connective tissue on the outside. And then can contrast that with the esophagus. And in that case, instead of columnar cells, those are stratified squamous. So as you swallow things, imagine swallowing a bunch of rough pretzels. It's going to scratch its way down your esophagus, right? So you want that to be protected. Uh, yeah, and you can see uh, a submucosal layer and a muscularis layer too. So they all have it. It's a little varied. All right, the whole gut tube, it's important in some diseases where if this innervation is cut off, um, you can no longer move stuff along. And it, you get megacolon. Always sounds like an action figure or something. But anyway, um, <clears throat> looking at the, the, uh, the innervation of the gut, it's going to be autonomic. It's going to be your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And remember, parasympathetic is going to get those muscles going. You're digesting. Sympathetic, if you're fight or fighting or running away, it's going to inhibit the digestion. That's why I don't want to go swimming right after you have a big meal. And you look at it, there's actually a plexus of nerves more on the inside, mucosally, kind of controlling the secretions, right? And then a, a myenteric or muscle layer farther out that's going to control the motility or the movement of the, of the muscles. Remember that peristalsis that moves things along? And here I'll show you a picture, just some histology to prove it. Uh, these are neurons, right? out there. Uh, and so you can see that's uh, some neurons as part of the myenteric plexus. There'd be another, you can't, there's none here, but there'd be some more in here. So these are the nerves that control the gut. 
All right, so the movement down, as you can see in this animation, is peristalsis. You've got the smooth muscle contracting the circular muscle behind it, relaxing in front of it. It's going to move things along. So unless you're vomiting, you want things to go in one direction. And at the end of the esophagus, you're going to have not a very impressive, but important sphincter, lower esophageal sphincter. Maybe some of you learned it as cardiac sphincter, because heartburn is actually acid coming through that. And it feels like it's behind your heart. And then uh, the stomach itself has an additional layer of muscle, remember, so it can really churn that food. Yeah. So starting with swallowing, uh, you have this upper esophageal sphincter has to relax. Then your pharynx muscles will constrict and push that down through the esophagus, not your windpipe, right, behind the esophagus. And then the esophagus muscles will push it down. It's not gravity, because you can stand on your head and still swallow upwards, right? So it's the muscles that come down. And then the lower esophageal sphincter will relax and allowing the whatever you swallow to go into the stomach. And then it will close again so the stomach acid doesn't reflux back up. Got it? Yes, and so eventually, um, the small intestine, the, the, your food looks like a milkshake consistency in there. And by the time it makes it to the end of the small intestine, you've taken out everything you're going to take out of it. You know, it's, through those, those meters of intestine, you've been able to take all the glucose and, and all the uh, vitamins that you need. And then this wateriness, you can't get rid of all that water, so the, the colon is going, to, is going to absorb that. So here's the ileum going into the cecum. So it comes out here as watery. It's a little valve there, so it doesn't go the opposite direction. And then the, as it goes through the colon, the water is sucked out and you end up dehydrating it and turning into this fecal mass. And movement in the, again, I can't review all of A&P, but movement in the large intestine is a little different. You have these mass movements where things kind of move all at once. In the small intestine, you have this churning and this gradual movement of it down. <clears throat> And then physiologically, looking at it uh, um, um, chemically, uh, you start digestion in the mouth of amylase, right? And then your stomach is all about uh, pepsin that breaks down proteins, hydrochloric acid too. Um, and then most of your enzymes, the, the, your, your pancreas makes almost everything. And then on the surface of your small intestine too, you make everything, lipases, proteases, uh, um, lactase, uh, you know, uh, sucrase, you know, everything you need to break down, uh, everything is going to gonna be found in the small intestine. Yeah, and, it, and it just a little preview, remember bile is made in your liver, stored in your gallbladder. Bile will help you emulsify or break up fats so you can digest them, and your pancreatic juice is filled with all kinds of things, and that's squirted into the first part of the small intestine. Now, the, the bacteria, um, there's a lot of research. I have an additional slide, that, a little more about this, because my, um, my office mate teaches about the gut-brain axis, this idea that, in reality, you're, you're, you think about serotonin that affects your moods. Well, your gut makes 95% of your serotonin. It's 5% is made by your brain. So there's a lot of new research seeing how, how important your bacteria in your gut are in your colon to your overall health. Um, some really cool research going on. Uh, there's, it's, there's this uh, talking back and forth between your brain and your gut. Um, but in your large intestine, uh, besides absorbing the water, uh, it's also the, uh, the bacteria make vitamin K, as I've mentioned to you guys in an earlier lecture. And so it's important if you guys take antibiotics, sometimes you have a vitamin K deficiency because this is one source you always have, even if you don't eat it, is that bacteria can make vitamin K. Um, yeah, some drugs metabolized. Um, yeah. And here it is. Just there's this big project looking at your gut flora, the bacteria in there. And your book talks about 500 species, or maybe there's 1,000 species, but in that ballpark of different kinds of bacteria, and there's trillions of them. And before you're born, you have zero. It's clean, right? You fall cells, right? But even in that birth, the, uh, just giving birth, bacteria are going to enter and start colonizing your intestines. And so cool research where they have people send in dirty diapers every day uh, so they can follow and then they take it to a lab. And they don't learn culture. They use DNA 
mouse to see what kind of bacteria are in there and how that changes with, uh, within a person as they grow and in different families and different households and different areas. Really, really cool. And so they're seeing that, you know, obesity, maybe it's part of it is you have a different gut flora. Yeah. And how antibiotics are going to affect that. You guys, you can eat probiotics, right? Like yogurts and stuff just to help you maintain your, your proper gut flora. So when you talk about your body, how many cells you have, we think you've got three to 10 to one more bacterial cells than actually Jeff cells. So pretty, pretty, pretty cool. And uh, you look at people with uh, irritable bowel syndrome and some of these things and see <clears throat> a lot of the culprit is looking at uh, changes in the bacteria. And so there's even fecal transplants. So you can get bacteria from someone else and put it in yours and things like that. So anyway, a lot of research here, I wanted to just make sure you guys are uh, clued into that. All right, so what are the major uh, problems? Uh, just real quickly an outline and then we'll get to them. You guys know what constipation and diarrhea are. Uh, opposite ends of the spectrum. Here's this great stool charts. Got this up on the wall. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> God, it's disgusting. Um, but anyway, uh, and diarrhea, uh, it's, it's a killer, of, of especially of, of children, because you lose so much water. And in other countries, if, you, if you're in the hospital, you get an IV, you're okay. But, um, but diarrheal diseases are up there in the top cause of killers in the world. And constipation and diarrhea are not diseases by themselves, just like anemia is not a disease, but it's a symptom. And you can look for that underlying cause. <clears throat> so irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, uh, unknown cause really. I mean, you can see how many people, if you read there, it, it affects. Um, but, you know, it has, you know, debilitating effects on people and really, just uh, changing your diet is all we got. So a lot of research done on this, very unhappy uh, colon. Now, uh, viral enteritis is getting a stomach bug. Uh, this is viral, you can have bacteria issues too. Um, but causes uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And usually you get over it, of course, it's a virus, so we can't do much about it. But uh, you can have an infection that gives you, you know, you, you feel t your gut feels terrible for days and then you get over it. Oh, yes, and sometimes there's a flu where uh, if you drink a lot the night before, the next day you have this flu. I'm not sure exactly what's going on. I don't know. All right, diverticulosis. As you get in the elderly, you'll see they have these little outpockings of the colon. And uh, those things can, get, uh, things can get caught in there, infected. They can even burst and shower your, your sterile peritoneal cavity with feces and bacteria, so it's life-threatening there. Um, but you can have them and not have any issues. A lot of people have, most people have diverticulitis when they're older, as they get in old age, and, and there's no problem unless something happens. Acid reflux or GERD um, is a major problem we'll talk about, about acid going from the stomach back up to the, the esophagus where it doesn't belong. And then we'll talk about this bacteria, Helicobacter pylori, the main cause of, uh, of ulcers. And the people that really discovered this, they, uh, scientists, they actually, no one believed them, they actually drunk the swamp water and they got sick. So they proved that. That's, that's a dedication to your, to, your, to your science right there. But uh, this H. pylori is going to be a major cause of ulcers and gastritis. Diseases of the anus. Didn't know I'd be saying that today. But uh, you have issues like in kids, they can get pinworms. They're actually roundworms and uh, cause it to be itchy down there and they scratch and they get eggs under their uh, fingernails and it spreads, uh, we got drugs for that. Um, and hemorrhoids uh, are when the vessels get inflamed, you have internal, external ones, they can end up bleeding or seriously getting, you know, they can throw some clots from there as well. And then anal fissures or abscesses cause a lot of pain and discomfort in people. And uh, these pylonid, pylonial, sinuses. I did not know what these were, but right here, some people have a little a divot, <laughs> a little opening, and that can get um, trapped and turned into a cyst. It can be very painful. So these are uh, apparently uh, pretty common. Polyps. In marine biology, it means a little, like a little 
a coral polyp, a little thing, little tentacles that comes off. But here, polyps, they grow anywhere. Mainly, mainly talking about the colon, but uh, you can have nasal polyps too that grow, that are gonna block off your uh, sinuses too. But um, these polyps grow and, and they can turn cancerous, they can bleed, they can obstruct the bowel. So talk about polyps. Hernias can happen, and an inguinal hernia happens in your, your groin region, in men especially, because we have this weakening where the testes is headed through. And if a piece of intestine, if there's like pressure, you're really straining, it can get pushed through there, and then it can get strangled and, 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 uh, and get an infarct and die and cause a lot of pain. So um, repair of inguinal hernias is a common, common uh, um, surgery. Other reasons for abdominal surgery, of course, appendicitis. Appendicitis, we'll talk about that. Bariatric surgery becoming more common uh, to help with obesity. And then removing cancerous polyps from the colon. You can remove big pieces of the intestines and you can still survive just fine. And then adhesions, uh, if you go through an abdominal surgery, um, you get in there, you do it, you put it all back together. What happens is that scar tissue forms and you'll have uh, normally your intestines and your stomach, everything move easily. They're slippery and they move easily, but adhesions can cause things to bind together and cause issues. So sometimes they got to go in and, and uh, clear off adhesions. And it, for intensive care, some serious problems, of course, are carcinomas, right? These are uh, uh, cancers. And then ulcers. When you think ulcer, I stress, I ulcer, but they, these can eat into ve uh, vessels and you can bleed out and die quickly from an ulcer. That happens. And an inflammatory bowel disease. Um, this is the, the, we'll talk about the two real similar forms, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Um, but these we think are autoimmune and uh, cause some, some major problems. And depending on the severity, you can see a lot of people, you know, just don't even go to the doctor. So we don't really know the real numbers on this, but only when it becomes really bad and depending on people's pain tolerances and stuff. All right, so let's talk about tests and symptoms and signs, things you're gonna look for. Here's our main issues, three. Hemorrhaging, blood. You can be throw up blood, you can have fecal blood. Um, so somewhere that there's a bleed, you gotta find it. I remember with uh, anemia, a slow bleed in your GI tract is a major cause of iron deficiency. Altered motility. Motility is movement of the gut. So we'll see if there's areas where your gut is uh, hypermobile or it's immobile, it's gonna be a big issue. If a piece of your intestine is not moving, it's gonna be a buildup, a blockage, and it's not gonna be good. And then perforations, these are always life-threatening. If you have holes anywhere, you can't have what's in your gut tube out in your uh, peritoneal cavity, because that is there's no bacteria out there. It's, it's uh, pretty sanitary. And so in your gut is all kinds of bad stuff, acids and enzymes and uh, uh, bacteria, and waste. So any kind of bowel perforation is serious. And sometimes on an x-ray, you can see that air builds up underneath the diaphragm if there's a leakage through the bowel tube. But that's just an aside. All right, so taking a look at what you might see with a hemorrhage, right. Definitely. So uh, hematemesis, em em emetics make you throw up. So this is blood in your, your vomit. These are going to be stools that are tar-like where the blood has been uh, digested. This is like fresh blood in the feces. Yeah, definitely. So what could cause it? Ulcers, uh, cancers, um, polyps that are bleeding in the colon, hemorrhoids that could be right down at the, in the, in the rectum, the, in the anal canal where that blood is coming from. Altered uh, motility. You may see vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, uh, painful obstruction, or problems swallowing. There's a, the ulcers being uh, constricted or something like that. Yeah, so we'll talk about, uh, about some of these diseases and some issues going on. Remember stenosis is gonna be narrow. Like a valve can be st stenosis of your mitral valve, something like that. Same thing with the gut, it can be narrowed. Yeah. And then perforations. Uh, you might see pain, this rigid abdomen. Some people, if they've got abdominal pain, they'll, they'll tense their abs because they're just trying to like protect their, their abdominal area. So this rigid abdomen, yeah. Lots of pain, fever, white blood cells because you have this, all of a sudden this acute infection, neutrophils are on their way. 
So causes of that, appendicitis, uh, breaking divertic, oh my God. Yes, when you have a diver, diverticulitis, diverticulitis, oh my gosh. I don't know what's wrong with me there. We have a little diverticulum, and uh, if that gets infected, uh, it can perforate. The wall will get uh, will get uh, weaker. That was weird. That was really weird. Yeah. Um, and obviously, cancers can weaken the wall too, and you got a perforation. So, big things here: the bleeding, uh, the motility, and then uh, perf any kind of perforation in this gut tube. Not good. All right. So let's talk hemorrhage. Let's talk bleeding first. Um, there can be the, the upper uh, bleeding, you can have bleeding, especially the esophagus, these esophageal uh, varicoses, these, um, you can have, uh, I get into too much, but you can have um, portal hypertension, you can have your, your liver blocking up blood, and then so the blood finds other veins to go through, and they can be swollen if they burst, cause deadly bleeding there. So you should know the term for vomiting blood. And some of this could be could be lung, right? But it could, it could be uh, 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 that's more coughing blood, I guess. But if you have blood from the mouth, it could be is it is it respiratory or is it uh, digestive? Um, it's melena. These these are when the stools when you have fresh blood, it's it's red you know, a, or dark, and it looks like but usually bright colored blood, right? But uh, these stools, the blood has already gone through the digestive system, so it kind of changes consistency. But you can tell it has that look like that's digestive blood. So there's a bleed. Um, and then lower, uh, lower uh, on digestive tract, um, hematochesia is going to be fresh blood. So it could be a polyp, it could be a hemorrhoid, but it's blood that's that's fresh. It's not a, a bleed up in your stomach that's made it all the way down. That's where you get the black tarry stools. This is fresh blood coming out. And sometimes you can't tell this, the, the feces. You can't tell if there's blood or not. So this. Uh, this uh, occult fecal blood test. Yeah, you can do this. You can do this. There's even ones you can do collect it at home, and uh, it uh, looks for uh, that. It, there's blood that you can't really see, and the reason is if you're like if you're anemic or you really look for colon cancer too. Here, if there's bleeding into your into your uh, colon, um, and so this gives you a clue uh, early on that there's blood. Altered motility. So it means your bowel is overactive or underactive. So you can listen, sometimes even without a stethoscope and you can hear bowel sounds. And especially if there's an obstruction, the bowel will be proximal to that, will be really moving to try to clear past that obstruction. Well, if there's no bowel sounds, that's a, that's a clue too. And uh, vomiting, diarrhea too. Obstructions, this is, this is an interesting one. So it, 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 your, your guts can move around, but sometimes it's not a good thing. They'll get twisted. And if they get too twisted, then all of a sudden you're cutting off part of it and that will get infected, severe abdominal pain. You gotta uh, do some surgery. <clears throat> Adynamic ileus. So it means dynamic means dynamic moving. So it means it's not. And if you have a, uh, part of the small bowel where the, the nerves are deadened for some reason, you're gonna have, uh, that part's gonna usually distend and uh, you're not moving through that part. You want all of your gut to be moving so that things move along. So if it's paralyzed, big issue. And this happens actually uh, first few days after usually when you have surgery in your abdomen, so they don't give you stuff to eat right away, uh, solid food. And then a big issue, <clears throat> of course, that we're bringing back is that uh, if you're having issues, especially with dysphagia and stuff, uh, if any of your, uh, if you're vomiting and you're not in complete control, uh, you can aspirate that. And that's, you don't want all your stomach contents to be in your alveoli, right? So when you look at signs, obviously these are symptoms too, if they come in and tell you, yeah, I've had diarrhea or constipation or vomiting. Um, these are uh, uh, things to, to, to take note of, and they're definitely um, uh, symptoms, something you need to find out what the, what the issue is. Um, and then structural alterations are different than functional. You know, the, the constipation and diarrhea, these are physiological, and uh, you can alter these with drugs as well. 
uh, structural alterations like uh, stenosis or uh, uh, dilated colon, things like that, um, uh, those things uh, often need to be, uh, have some surgical remedies. <clears throat> so like I say, any perforations, no, bad, 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 bad. The burst appendix, life-threatening, um, because that, imagine the, the, your things inside your intestines being all of a sudden let free in your body. It's going to cause peritonitis, peritonitis, extreme pain, and tons of neutrophils rushing to try to clean up. But that hole's open. I mean, it's just pouring out the, the materials that should be in your gut, not in your body cavity. Yeah. So rapid shock, fever, white blood cells, life-threatening. So dysphagia, problem swallowing, right? <clears throat> now you see this, I show this just to show, you see it more in the elderly. Uh, <clears throat> as they get the, uh, they get older, and if you have an altered mental status too, of course, they really worry about uh, being careful when you're feeding them so they don't aspirate some of that food. Um, could be esophageal lesions, that's true. Um, uh, take a look here, here's a, a carcinoma in the wall of the esophagus leading to narrowing, and so people, you vomit a lot because you can't you know, push it past that. Um, some of the tests might be uh, to take a, a sample of uh, 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 your stomach contents. So they have various tubes that come down and suck up some uh, a sample to take a look at the acidity. Uh, maybe your um, parietal cells <clears throat> are making acid or something like that. Um, yeah, and they can take a look and get uh, ideas if you're doing it, if you have malabsorption problems, whether you're absorbing things correctly. Yeah, exactly. So they can take a look and see what the issue might be. Now you can get a, sometimes you need a fecal sample. A urine sample tells you things. A fecal sample tells you, well, if you suspect, suspect parasites, you can find ame amoebas and various kinds of roundworms in there, uh, tapeworm eggs, you know, I could see what kind of parasites you got going on. And then uh, you can do a fecal culture to look at uh, pathogens, right? Some kind of shigella or nasty E. coli, right? And then we have these breath tests too. This is really interesting where they can even tell, um, um, uh, gets a lot of data, as I mentioned, because it's coming out of what's being in your bloodstream is gonna go what's gonna um, diffuse out into, into the air. So they get really sensitive, cool tests um, uh, to look at issues there. All right, and of course, a biopsy. <clears throat> they wanna take a look at the, the epithelium or maybe the muscles or look for nerves if it's gonna be like, issue with a, um, a megacolon down there and they want to take a look at the they want to get a sample of biopsy and they can tell a lot right from there see if you have gluten sensitivity things like that yeah inflammatory development autoimmune and cancers you need a biopsy so they can pathologists can look at it radiological techniques you know we talked about x-rays and ct scans looking at the chest uh, here we can have a um, you can take a look at uh, um, um, CT scans, MRIs, uh, x-rays even, and take a look what's going on with your, your gut. Now this new idea, this, this virtual endoscopy, look at this, this shows like an actual picture. So a colonoscopy, they can put a camera in there with a light on it, they're looking at it directly, right? But now they're doing colonoscopies using computers and CT scans. So uh, look at the, I mean, look how similar those are, it's pretty cool. You need that resolution to pick up even the smallest polyps. So the gold standard is a colonoscopy. It's like, I want to see what's in the colon, right? You might miss something with this, but they're getting better and better. Because a colonoscopy is so invasive, they try to have alternatives to be better. If they want to look at the colon, they can do give you a barium enema, where they put a contrast in your, your anus, and they put it in that way, and it fills in every nook and cranny. You can see uh, if there's a diverticulum or something like that, yeah. yeah. Yes, but endoscopy, if you hear uh, stigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy, it just depends how far they're putting the camera up. And uh, they can visualize, they can get an image of it. And with a colonoscopy, they could even have tools where they can remove polyps, take samples, things like that. Uh, upper GI, Endoscopy, they'll put uh, the, the camera from the, from the, the head end instead of the, the butt end. Uh, 
and they can look in the stomach and even push it past uh, to look into the, the duodenum. They may be looking for bleeds, uh, uh, ulcers, things like that. And now there's even these cool cameras that you swallow and it takes its way all the way through your gut. You pass it, but who cares? You just flush it away because the, the images from that are transmitted to a, a computer. And so you have a, there's a light in it and as it goes down, it gets the whole image of your whole tract from mouth to anus. So really, really cool. And here's a picture, for instance, that I took of that. Yeah, and then this shows a scope coming in there. All right, so that was kind of lengthy, right? So we talk about everything from, uh, from, from samples to, to, to uh, scoping to radiographs, right? So all these things, all these uh, symptoms and signs that something's going wrong in your GI tract. You got a tummy ache, are you vomiting blood? All these things are good, good signs. All right, this is a weird one, Meckel's diverticulum. I remember teaching gross anatomy, we would always look for this. It's about 2% of the population, but it's where, as, a, as, a, as an embryo, there was a little connection to this yolk sac that we had. And that usually just flattens out, but sometimes it leaves a little diverticulum. And within that, you can have not only colon tissue, but like stomach or other kinds of tissue can grow in there. And it normally doesn't cause a problem. You can have Meckel's diverticulum, they find an autopsy, oh, it never, never caused a problem. But uh, sometimes it starts secreting acids and such, and it can, you can have a perforation there. So Meckel's diverticulum can become an issue sometimes, or it gets blocked off, uh, but it's a cool little congenital thing that some people were born with. And here it is, this little finger connecting to the umbilical cord, these two, yeah. And I'll show you some of these other ones. Uh, just real briefly, you can see, look at this. This is esophageal atresia. The esophagus doesn't connect, oh my God. It's just sometimes it's a dead end sac. So you swallow something, it just stops, right? Um, or it's, it's often, uh, you'll see, it's connected to the trachea. So during development, things can happen when things go wrong, yeah. You can have a, a diaphragmatic hernia, where there's a hole in your diaphragm, and your guts go up in your chest cavity. Yeah, not good. You need, it usually just takes up room that you need for your lungs. Then an imperforate anus. You're going to see all kinds of varieties of this, where the anus stops. I mean, where the, the, the large intestine stops is not connected. And many times it'll be connected here to the vagina or the urethra or something. There's like one opening instead of having an anus. So these things are the congenital, most common congenital issues in the digestive tract. Here's the esophageal atresia. I, I got some more, some data here for you. You can see uh, most of the time, look at that. It's just a dead end. The esophagus stops. And uh, a piece of esophagus connected to the uh, trachea. Not good, right? No, you do not want that, right? In other cases, nothing's connected, et cetera. So when they find this out, they'll know pretty quickly. Um, um, you try to feed, it's, it's not gonna happen. Um, and then you're gonna um, be able to surgically correct this thing. Yeah. And here's that uh, hole in the diaphragm. Like, oh my God, you know, intestines are pushed up into alongside your lung. And then a perforate anus, you can see right here, no connection. Nothing's gonna coming out, right? And you can see here uh, where it has actually connected to a different place. So these are all things that um, um, can be surgically corrected. They'll notice right away if you, there's no anus, you know, they can, they can build one for you, things like that. All right, here's a common one. Um, your pyloric sphincter can become narrowed because the muscle is just really bulky for some reason. And it's just, nothing's gonna come out of there. So you can take food into your stomach, but then you end up just throwing up. And for some reason, it doesn't occur right away, but like you can see, two to four weeks, there's just vomiting. Um, it happens in boys, I'm not sure why. And um, um, they go in there, easy surgery, they go in, they just slit the muscle to relax it, and then things work again. But congenital pyloric stenosis, your pyloric sphincter is born too small. And lastly, this Hirschsprung disease. Um, this is something where the, uh, the ganglia, the nerves, um, are not working for a piece of the colon somewhere. And um, what happens is if you don't have any ganglions in a certain segment, that's not mobile and it ends up just distending. It just the feces builds up in there. So you'll have a kid that has this huge mass in the abdomen, you can feel it and they're not 
going, they're not having any feces, like, oh my gosh, it's building up, right? And so they got to usually go cut out that part and just reconnect it. Um, but this disease, uh, as you can see here, constipation, because it just builds up. And uh, if they do a biopsy of this wall, it's like, whoa, they look for those, those, those nerves, and they don't find them. All right, you guys. So we got just to talk about some congenital things. Um, um, and now uh, part two, we'll get to uh, the gastric uh, reflux and, and ulcers and food poisoning and hernias. And then we'll get to the colon cancers and such. All right. I will. All right, so uh, let's let's do that one next. Uh, good stuff.